tuned for that. Uh, but right now, I would love you to give a very warm welcome to Mr. Matt Jacoby. Welcome, Matt. It's good to be here. It's so great to have you here. So yeah. for those who may be less familiar with who you are, uh, maybe tell us a bit about yourself. What do you get up to when you are not a Hub guest speaker? Though I'm sure that's top of the list. This, of course, dominates my life. Um, <laughs> Uh, apart from this, uh, so I'm the senior pastor of a church in Geelong called One Hope Church. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's quite a big church. We've got a couple, uh, th three locations actually, and a um, uh, great team. Many of you will know Mark and Amy Jelly. I want to apologise because we took them back to Geelong. Uh, and it's been amazing uh, having those guys. Um, I'm also, uh, so that's part-time actually, because I'm also part-time on faculty at the Melbourne School of Theology, and uh, I teach philosophy. So my um, academic background is in theology and philosophy, but actually mainly in uh, philosophy. Yes, yeah. I was actually privileged enough to study under Matt when I was at MST about mm. seven years ago, um, did the subject called Christian Worship, mm. uh, and Matt's teaching, particularly on the Psalms and the Psalms of Lament, uh, was very formational for me, so I feel very privileged mm. to have done that study. Speaking of the Psalms, something you didn't mention is Sons of Korah. Could you maybe speak a little bit about that as well? Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Um, uh, yeah, for, for many years I also um, worked on a uh, project uh, with a group called Sons of Korah over probably uh, 25 years uh, or so. And um, yeah, we traveled all over and um, uh, had great, you know, great support for our project. And we put, I don't know, nearly 80 to 100 psalms to music. Um, and we still sort of chop away at that. I have a little less time for that uh, these days. But, you know, it's, it's like a really glorified hobby. Yeah. One way of putting it. Now, this is probably like trying to ask you to pick a favourite child. But speaking of the Psalms, do you have a favourite Psalm or some that you just always keep coming back to? Or is it just too hard to choose? It's too hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's too hard. I don't think... Um... No, it's too hard. It's too hard. <laughs> I think I would feel yeah. the same. Well, Matt, we're really looking forward to what you have to share for us tonight. Let me just pray briefly uh, as Matt begins. Yeah, Father God, we're so grateful for the gift of prayer and the gift of relationship we have with you. Lord, thank you for Matt for his wisdom and experience and knowledge and all that he's bringing to this topic. Uh, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would give him discernment and sensitivity uh, to know the words to share, the words that you are putting on his heart uh, for this group of people in this time and this place. Lord, thank you for his generosity of time in being here. And I pray that we would also be generous with our attention, uh, that we would be attentive to all that you have to speak to us. Uh, Holy Spirit, would you move in us and transform us and draw us deeper to yourself, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Matt. Over you. Um, I'd like to uh, begin by, I'm going to move a little closer to you if that's all right. I'd like to begin by reading uh, just a, a verse from Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. It says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him, and this is the bit that I want to focus on, anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And that by the second part, it means that you can have some expectation that like, there's something there for you, you know, that, that he, uh, that when you seek him, that there's something that you get to find. Uh, so uh, that goes right back to the beginning. And, and I, um, as we talk about prayer, uh, I want to go right back to the basics, but I want to do that in a way that I hope isn't cliched, because I think where we get tripped up the most is right back at the real fundamentals, like the real fundamentals. And uh, fundamentals actually about God. I think we already get something really wrong at that point. And, and, and I know for me that recognizing this uh, has made an enormous difference uh, in my life as I came uh, to recognize this very important, uh, something very important about God that I want to share with you tonight. Now, no nothing of what I say is going to be revolutionary. In fact, I'm quite committed not to saying anything new. Um, but this is something I think that, that we easily lose touch with. We have, uh, we have tended to fall into what one theologian refers to as um, a kind of monopolytheism. Uh, and what he means by that, 
that we, we've, it's like we've got rid of the ancient beliefs in lots of different gods and we've narrowed it down to one, but we still think about that one God as like the bearded guy in the sky. Some of you might be able to picture, and if you've got a phone with you, you can look up um, Michelangelo's um, painting, uh, The Creation of Adam. And in that painting, there's, there's uh, uh, well, there's Adam kind of lying back, you know, with his, you know, the two fingers, painting with the two fingers. You've probably seen that's creation of Adam. Uh, if, if you don't know it, uh, quickly look it up, but don't check your social media or anything like that. Um, uh, and it's really interesting because you wonder, how does this guy think he can get away with portraying God? I mean, you know, do not make an engraven image, like don't portray God. Well, this is how he thinks he can get away with it. He actually hasn't painted, in his mind, he's not painted God. He's actually painted Zeus. And the, the idea of God as the bearded guy in the sky, we've sort of gets a bit locked in our imagination. And obviously what Michelangelo has thought, look, I'll paint Zeus and I'll use Zeus as a sort of symbol for, you know, the transcendent God. Yeah, I don't think he quite gets away with it. But, uh, but we do tend to picture God a, a little bit uh, in that way. Another mistake, uh, a mistaken uh, view uh, uh, of, of God that, um, you know, perhaps a sort of another version of that is this belief in a kind of deism. Uh, and deism is this idea, it's sort of, um, there is, by the way, this is going to be really practical. I just, this is, I know it's going to sound a little technical for a moment, but uh, this is enormously experiential. I think if you get what I'm going to say tonight, this will make a massive difference to your experience of God. I'm, I feel very confident of that. Um, but let me just do some uh, technical stuff. Uh, and um, uh, because I am also a professor of philosophy, I got to throw in a bit of that as well, just for fun, you know. Um, so what, what actually happened during the, the scientific revolution, some of you will, will, will know a guy called Isaac Newton. He came up with this picture of the universe as like a big machine. And what emerged from that, if the universe is a big machine, then God is the machine maker. And, and what it created was this distinction between the natural world, right? And that all just all clocks away like a big machine, right? And then there's God that sort of sits outside of that. And he's the one that made the big machine, right? And occasionally he comes in and when something breaks, he'll come in and sort of fix it up. And then he'll go back and he'll sit on his nice big seat and stroke his beard uh, up in heaven. I mean, I know that's a caricature, but that idea of the, that whole distinction between the natural and the supernatural did not exist before that time. People did not differentiate between the natural and the supernatural. And the interesting thing is, actually, that Newtonian view of the universe, any, any physicists uh, here? Um, I'm just going to check, because otherwise this could be embarrassing, because I'm, I'm, I'm not a physicist. Um, but I do know, after many attempts to immerse myself and go down the deep rabbit hole of quantum physics and quantum field theory and all of that sort of stuff, uh, is that that is complete being superseded. Um, that the reality is way weirder than that, right? And um, that's all I'm going to say about that. Needless to say, that that picture of the universe like the big machine, and it's all just this thing that kind of runs on its own, that actually isn't the biblical view either of God or creation. According to Scripture, God not only creates but sustains and upholds the universe in fact According to scripture, um, God is not this sort of discrete being sitting you know, up there in the sky with his beard. God is what we call, and this, he, this is where we get to the basics, he's omnipresent, he's, in, in other words, he's all present and all powerful. And in fact, as the, as the Westminster Confession of Faith says, he is the fountain of all being, right? Now, so at the most, he, he is the source of the life that animates you right now. He is, the fact that there is something rather than nothing, being itself, is, uh, finds its source in God. It's slightly different to saying that God is being, and some theologians have said that, uh, and, and we, we, we wouldn't say that. I think that statement, God is the fountain of all being, uh, is, is more accurate. So, um, why does this matter? Let me just quickly tell you why this, that this matters. Because... One of the mistakes that I 
habitually made. And this is, a, this is an issue that often as a pastor, I get people coming to say, one of the hardest things about prayer is that I just feel like, God, where are you? Like, you know, and we keep, we, it can easily feel like we're just talking to the walls and talking into space and, and, you know, yes, I've tried to pray, but I just didn't feel like God was there. And, and I often ask the question of people, what is it that you're expecting to happen? What are you actually expecting? What would convince you that God is really there? And inevitably, it always comes back to something. Something. But see, God is not some thing. God is the fountain of all thingness. It's made up a word. But he is not some thing. He's not a discrete thing. So if you experience some thing, that's infinitely less than God. And God will not compromise his greatness. God does things and he creates things, but those things aren't God. And the problem is when we go after experiences, an experience is something different to God because God, and I'm going to make the point, uh, a very important point in a, in, a, in a moment about experience because I do think we can, we, uh, we can experience God, but I'll explain that in a moment. When we're, when we're looking for some experience, and this is what often it comes down to, is this sense, I've got to, unless I have some big experience, unless I get really emotional or I feel warm and fuzzy or I feel electricity or something, right, then somehow I haven't really experienced God. Now, this is where I want to make a really important point, very, very important. The fact is you are experiencing God right now. But it's at such a fundamental level. Your experience of God is such a fundamental. And Paul says in Romans chapter 1, although they knew God, he says everyone knows God. Basically. Everyone knows God. At the most fundamental sense, in the most fundamental sense. You are experiencing God right now, all the time, with such constancy. And it's actually the very constancy of the experience that causes you not to know it. That causes you not to recognize it. So for a start, the very life that animates you flows directly from God. God is the source of life. Your consciousness, this amazing thing called consciousness, is a direct participation in something from God. It's not itself God, but you are experiencing something divine, something from God. God is so immediately present all the time that it's easy for us to miss it because we don't know any difference. Like the fish in the ocean that says, where is the ocean? I keep talking about the ocean. I don't see an ocean. Where is this ocean? Well, the ocean is everywhere. Inside the fish, outside the fish. God is everywhere. See, one of the other problems is that we have this addiction, and I'm gonna, I'll call it an addiction. Is that an overstatement? Let me think. No, it's not an overstatement. We have an addiction, I think, to a way of knowing that makes us into something like God. We have this deeply embedded God complex. This is actually, it's essentially that that's what sin is. Best definition of sin, I think, is this kind of radical autonomy. I am the God of my own life. Of course, in Genesis chapter 3, uh, the temptation was then you will be like God, okay? So we have this, this desire to know um, on our terms and it acts something like this. I need uh, a prop. I'm just going to grab this for a second. Um, this is where uh, I'm going to get a little philosophical for a moment, but um, I'd better just take a drink. Everyone take a deep breath. And don't be scared. <laughs> uh, habitually, and this is, this is uh, again, probably more um, a result of probably the last four or 500 years. Uh, we, in our culture, we have this 
because it's not the same in other cultures. It tends not to be the same in other cultures, as readily pointed out. Uh, we have this way of knowing that you would describe a subject-object knowledge, right? I'm the subject, and here's the object, right? And, and I, I won't recognize something as knowledge unless I can grasp it, right? Like, grasp it intellectually. It's got to be either an intellectual object that I can see, that I can kind of, you know, look at and, and circumscribe, in a sense, intellectually. And I can look at it and examine it, and it like an object, right? I'm the subject, and it's the object. And a lot of conversations about God, even well-meaning apologetics, can be people just kind of putting, saying, there's God, the idea of God. Now, let's just walk around it. Let's have a look. Let's, do, let's analyze it logically. Let's see if it's real. Let's just analyze it and probe it intellectually. What the? What, what is that? <laughs> that would not be God then. That would be an idol. I mean, not the actual drink, but, you know. But anyway, um, and that would actually make us God. I mean, wasn't it the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? That was the temptation in the first place, right? Where you get to stand outside reality as God and you get to be the one that makes the judgments about what's real and true and valuable. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's the kind of knowledge that, that we want, right? I want to know, right, God, where are you? Okay, if I don't see something, right, God, come on, appear, something. Give me, give me something, otherwise I'm not going to recognize. Unless you become infinitely less than you are, then I'm not going to recognize that you're there. That's a problem. That's a kind of idolatry. And you can see that when it comes to approaching God, how much of a problem that's going to be, right? That gets you off to a completely wrong start. The fact is that you are in the midst of the biggest miracle right now. There is a miracle happening. It's called life. It's called consciousness. And why is it that we feel like unless God, the deistic God, comes in, steps into the big machine, does something, some fireworks, some fancy tricks, right, messes with the machine, and then it's like then we, and we won't recognize it until that happens. But the whole miracle of life and consciousness and the universe is one big miracle, including you. We are experiencing God all the time, constantly. And so prayer begins with an acknowledgement of that. Prayer begins not with us trying to get to some experience. It actually begins with that recognition. Lord, you are here. You are present. I am immersed in your presence. You are immersed in the presence of God. There is more divine activity in every electron in your body than you can possibly imagine. Are there are electrons. In anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, That's, that is so important that you realize that. And what is this has done for me, it stops me from thinking, oh, is God really there? Like, is, where, where is, because it's a kind of idolatry straight away. And look, I mean, one of the, thing, one of the other things that has tended to cause that in the, the sort of, the wonderful stream of the Christian movement that, that we're, we're in, that uh, we used to refer it to uh, as the evangelical movement, sort of came out of the Great Awakenings uh, in the 1700s and the 1800s. This has unfortunate political overtones uh, now. But uh, this stream that we're in, there's been lots of amazing things that God has done. Uh, you know, like, sometimes we do have amazing experiences, sometimes even weird experiences. And they're, they're, you know, we've seen God do amazing things down through history, but we have this way of idolizing the last big thing that God did. So unless God does some big thing, we have some big experience, just like the Israelites when they, you know, started worshiping the bronze snake, if you know that story, something that God did, and then it, suddenly that becomes the object of a kind of idolatry. Man, humans, are, we're, we're, we're experts at taking something good and messing it up. So God's presence is 
This is the picture that I, uh, that I find uh, useful. And it's a metaphor, and because it's a metaphor, it's, you know, uh, it's actually, it's a metaphor that's used uh, in Scripture. Scripture talks about a, a lot about the river of life, but it's my way of kind of expressing the fact that we are immersed in God, but God is not a static, God is a person. Um, uh, so I'm not advocating a, a kind of pantheism here. God is a person. He is, he is personal, right? And so because he's personal, there's a, there's a sort of movement in the being of God. It's like, um, and, and we can relate to God in either, either of uh, two ways. It, if, if God is moving, we can either go against God or with God. It's like the current of a great river, right? And, you know, have you ever seen a really, like, think, imagine a massive river, right? Um, now, the, the analogy breaks down because God is infinite, right? He's not, and I'm describing something finite, right? But just describe, like, in some, in some way, a, a sort of infinite river. Because we are, we are immersed in an infinite river, the infinite presence of God. And God is moving, all the time, moving. And one of the things about massive rivers, the bigger the river the more powerful it is. Think of the amount of water moving in a big river, right? But it's so much water that when you look at it, it doesn't look like it's moving at all. In fact, it, is, it looks absolutely peaceful. And yet, it is unfathomable power. And life, for me is all about allowing myself, allowing the river, the, allowing myself to flow with the river of God. Allowing myself to recognize I'm immersed in the river of God and I'm not going to, I'm going to move with God rather than against God. And the goal of prayer, so that's, that's like the beginning, I mean, goodness. <laughs> this is basic, I know this is basic stuff. And maybe some of you think, duh, I already get all of this. But I suspect that a lot of you here have been tripped up because, I don't know, you're chasing some big experience. Please hear me tonight. You are having an experience. You are having an incredible experience constantly. God is present. God is everywhere. It says in Psalm 139, you hem me in behind and before you have laid your hand upon me. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me and your right hand will hold me fast. You cannot escape God. And the beauty of faith... Faith is, in a sense, allowing ourselves to be carried by God. It's abandoning the assertion of our autonomy, stop trying to be God, and immerse ourselves in God. And this really, this really is the goal of prayer. Uh, the goal of prayer, I would you, see, you might think um, that if you're praying for something, uh, that you want to see God do. You might think that the goal would be that I get the thing that I'm praying for. I mean, that would make sense. That's the goal, right? If I'm praying for something, the goal would be that I sort of get the thing that I'm praying for, right? No, it's not. That's not, not for God. This is very important that we realize this. Because otherwise, our priorities are not aligning with God's priorities. I would describe the goal in terms of a kind of um, confluence. You know the word confluence. Uh, confluence is when uh, like two rivers join or like a creek. Imagine a little creek and it joins a great river and it becomes one with the great river. It's that your, your, um, that your desires in a sense become one with God's desires. In him, Paul says, we live and move and have our being and there's a sense of, uh, in, in which prayer is about joining with God. It's about that connection with God. It's about moving with God. It's not about primarily getting what you want, but wanting the things that God wants for you. 
It's about confluence. It's about becoming one with that wonderful flow of God. I mean, someone said to me once, so can you pray about anything? And I said, yeah. Uh, it, what, so anything that I want, I can pray for. Uh, I said, yeah. Um, and I said, right, what if I want a red Ferrari? And I said, if you really want a red Ferrari, you definitely should pray about that. Like, you should definitely take that to God and see what he says about that. Like, really, please do. You especially should. Because he actually might change you more than your circumstances. Because prayer is all about confluence. It's all about that experience of oneness with God and flowing with God. And there's such a sense of rest in that and tranquility in that. That's the goal. Paul says, pray in the spirit on all occasions. And what he means is become one in spirit with God. And in, in, I think it's in, I um, uh, forget where this other reference is. Paul talks about becoming one in spirit uh, with God. There's this sense of, uh, in, in all things, God is drawing us into synchronicity with himself, into confluence with himself. And there's a wonderful restfulness in that place. And, you know, it's like the, you, in the end, it's, you have peace not because everything goes well, but you know that as you flow with God, you know, the river will hit rapids, okay? And it's going to get rough and you'll hit against rocks and, and it, you know, it's going to be turmoil. But, you know, the river that flows in always comes out the other side. And if you notice that, you know, rocks and boulders and it, it doesn't stop the river. The river just flows right through it, right? So it's like if you stay in the flow, yep, you'll get hit around, but stay with God because you'll flow in one side and out the other side. Don't hold on to things on the way. Don't try and control things. Let God be God. The river of God will draw you through all sorts of different landscapes. But stay in the river. Because the God who draws you in will draw you out the other side and out into eternity. I think that was the main thing uh, I was, I was going to uh, talk about in regards to prayer. Um, maybe I'll stop and um, we can have a discussion. Are there too many people if we have a discussion or ask questions? or um, I may not be able to answer your questions, but I, I feel like it would be good to maybe have a chat about some of that. Um, so, uh, yeah, anyone... Want to start us off? Check. Hey, thanks, Matt. That was awesome. Um, you threw out a lot of big terms. You said pantheism. You said. Oh, yeah, sorry. Do you yeah, want to yeah, explain yeah. some of that, please? Yeah, sorry. I mean, I mainly, that was mainly for the people, th you know, who were sitting there thinking, oh, I think this guy's a pantheist. <laughs> I don't know. If anyone was sitting there thinking that. But I'm pedantic, right? So I'm imagining the guy sitting there thinking this sounds like pantheism. Pantheism is the view. Um, uh, pantheism is the view that um, uh, God is everything, that universe is God. You know, um, so... Um, yeah, and there's, there's other sorts of uh, pantheism. There's a... Anyway, but that's kind of, yeah, where everything is God. Yeah. Okay. When you wake up tomorrow morning and you go to spend time with God and you're going to immerse yourself in the river of God, um, what is that looking like practically? Like uh, you're reading the Bible, you're immersing yourself in the river of God. Is that, is that an awareness or is there some sort of structure? Oh, yeah, you... let, me, let me say something uh, else about that. You reminded me, actually, of something that I was going to say. Uh, very important, actually. Thanks, Tom. The other thing, I mean, look... The other thing, and this is the cliche, um, aren't cliches annoying? Because it's like, oh, yeah, I know, but I find it's one of those things that you know and you hear it all the time, but you find it really hard to believe. 
Uh, it's good to be honest about that um, because you get really annoyed by them, but you don't want to tell anyone that you're really annoyed by it. Uh, God loves you. Um, a lot of people may find that really annoying because like I know that, but I just don't feel like God loves me. And, uh, and so the reason, let me just say, the reason God loves you uh, is actually not because of you. I know that sounds uh, um, strange. Oh, this is also basic, pretty basic theology here. The reason that God loves you is because God is love. Um, in theology, we say that God's love is not creature dependent. God loves you because he is love. God, uh, God's love is what we call an essential attribute of God. In other words, it, God wouldn't be God if God was not love. John says in uh, John chapter 4, those three words, God is love. He doesn't just say God is loving. Like I could say about my children, I am loving towards my children. But you couldn't say of me that I am love, right? That's like, no, but God is love. Um, so what that means is, is that God doesn't see someone and think, oh my goodness, you are amazing, Tom. Like, therefore I love you. Like, as, and I'm sure you are. But that's not why God loves you. You know what I mean? It's not because he looks at you and think, whoa, this guy's amazing. And see, we think that, right? Because we think, oh, I can imagine that God would love Tom, but not so much me, right? We often think that. I could imagine that God would really want to bless Tom, but not really me. But God's, God doesn't love you because of you. He loves you because he is God. He is, God. He is your father, God. I mean, goodness. Um, I don't love my children even because of, the, you know, because of their achievements and attributes. How, how much more with God? Not only that, but God came to us and paid in Jesus Christ, so that we could be reconciled. Like, this is how much, as John goes on to say, this is how much God loves us, that he came to us in Jesus Christ and suffered and died on a cross to pay. And so, if your sins are many, that doesn't disqualify you, that just makes you expensive. <laughs> and when we pay for something really expensive, you want to get that thing more than the other things. So if you feel like you've got a like, man, I, I've got a lot of sin, then Jesus is coming to you first, right? Because you are expensive. So don't rem so remember that. You've got to remember that. That's why. And so the reason why I thought of that is because the two things, I think this is, I think I've internalized this so much. These two things, I feel like, because I'm a bit of an overthinker, right? Any overthinkers in the room? Right, I'd, right, I would, right, this is my prayer time, right? Well, this is what it used to be like. Uh, I would, right, I'm pray, I've got my prayer time, right? And you know what I'd do? I'd start thinking about praying. There's a, there's a great way to destroy your prayer time. Start thinking about praying, right? Because then you're thinking, oh, where is God anyway? And then, and then your thoughts become like one of those abstract art films that are all sort of clipped together without any, you know, and, and you, you, you've, your thoughts are running around like a hyperactive puppy dog chasing seagulls. And, and you're thinking, what, like, what is, God? you know, you, you just, your mind's going all over the place. So, you, so um, I think, uh, you know, the difference is, and, and of course, you know, we can be absent-minded and everything, but, um, uh, what it, what it has meant that I stopped thinking about whether God's there anymore and how, you know, and all of this sort of stuff. And, and I actually begin with an acknowledgement. It's this acknowledgement of two things, that God is present and that he loves me. And I, I think I've inhabited those truths so constantly that I don't think I can doubt that anymore. Like, I just know God loves me. And I know I'm immersed in his presence. And prayer is all about response. That's a big one. Because you think you started the conversation. You didn't start the conversation. Prayer is response to God. So it's about you responding to what God is already doing, already saying, already said. Um, so that's, that's what it feels like for me. Often, uh, often it feels like just not necessarily praying, just being aware, being present. Uh, you know, um, I think one of the biggest problems is not so much that God is absent, but that we're absent. 
in a sort of a, a weird kind of um, like a really extreme case of absent mindedness. Like we actually, um, you know, we we need to begin just by recognizing God, you're present, you're here. I acknowledge your presence. Um, that's kind of for me uh, how w- what that looks like. It's not like go down the list. It's just this sense of ale- allowing myself space. I put myself in spaces of time and not looking to necessarily achieve anything. I will talk to God about things, generally responding to what I feel like God is doing and saying, you know, I mean, all this sort of stuff. There's no pattern, but I allow time and time to be present. That sounds wishy washy, but it's difficult to uh, explain. Someone ask another question, I'll think of something more intelligent to say. Um, what you talked about in terms of God being everywhere and ever present, I think that was really awesome and really powerful. What does it mean then for us that the Holy Spirit dwells in us? Oh, good question, right. Um, so, uh, um, like the the Bible uses this sort of spatial, and I, I think I'm, I think I'm getting what you what you're talking about. Like you know, James says, "Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you." Right, and and it's talking about relational nearness. It's not like, you know, uh, it's not like there are spaces where where God, you know, spaces in the world where where God is not. Um, it's you know, God is present everywhere but there's so that's so when when James says draw near to God and he will draw near to you he's talking about um sort of relational nearness and um the idea of our hearts being filled with the Holy Spirit is is um this idea that when we give ourselves to God um then our very selves become the habitation of God in a very special, relational, intimate sense. Um, and, and so a lot, of that, a lot of that's about those, you know, is, is about the relational dynamic. So, you know, um, when the Bible talks about being filled with the Spirit, um, it's not like, you know, I mean, it's not like you're up to your ankles and then you're up to your knees and, you know, it's... Uh, it, it's like the more that you yield and let God be God, the more confluence, in a sense, there is in your heart, right? It's like um, your, your whole being becomes this habitation of God in, in, in that sort of in a ineffable sort of sense. Yeah. Did, is that kind of, is that all right or... or? Anyway, you can tell me later. Like, give me. Yeah, it's like, mate, you. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> How are we tracking for time, Lauren? Sorry. Yeah. So the. So, sorry. Just let me. You know, a lot of that that spatial metaphorical language is really important. Like, it's. I mean, actually, you know, it's. And, and it's not even. It's not even that it's not true. It's just. It's just remember you're trying to you're trying to speak because it talks about God's arms of love, all these sorts of things. That's absolutely fine. You know. Um, you know, we talk about God moving and moves of God and, uh, you know, that's all, that's great. Like that's all, don't abandon that language. Just don't be drawn in to thinking that all of those issues that I talked about before. Yeah. Matt, can you talk about living in prayer if we're living in a river and in the confluence, mm. rather than having a prayer. Talk. Oh yeah, good. Yeah, um, this. I think this. Uh, I I do think quality time is important. I you know I, I I put aside you know quality time and often spaces in time because our lives are so busy and there's so much noise in our lives. We need time to um, you know to slow down and make space. But I think that would the change, I think, for me uh, has been, and it's partly as a result of this constant, this sense of awareness of God all the time, is that I find that prayer is a much more constant thing f- 
for me through the day. I'm much more aware of what God is doing and saying. Uh, I I have this sense that God is always speaking to me and guiding me. Because I think sometimes we have this approach to our relationship with God where we go visit. You know, God is like, you know, uh, grandma. We go visit grandma, have a cup of tea and a biscuit, you know, for an hour. And then we go off and we live our lives. We sort of tick the box, visited grandma for the week, right? I think sometimes we can treat God like that. And God, he doesn't want you to visit him. He doesn't want visitors. <laughs> uh, he wants to move in with you constantly. Um, he loves quality time. Uh, but I think where he wants this to go with you is a constant awareness that he's always speaking to you. This is what I love about, this is now what I love about life and all of the hardships and the chaos and whatever is that you get to walk through it with God constantly and everything that happens I can say even if I don't even if it's terrible and often it is I can say Lord what are you saying to me what are you what is it that I need to hear and it's like this constant sense of God guiding and showing me it makes it means that God is it, that, that life is this constant um, conversation with God And sometimes, you know, I mean, sometimes I check out and I don't pay attention. That doesn't mean God's not there. It just means I'm not paying attention. That's the difference. Uh, That's the difference for me. But I do find it important, actually, to... um, uh, One of the most important things to me is to make space, like almost like um, not only space in time, but mental space for God. Um, because we're typically, um, we're typically uh, very mentally hyperactive and also very, very stimulation addicted. Uh, probably every, everyone in this room would be uh, quite seriously stimulation addicted. Um, so what you would find, for example, a symptom of that would be if, if I was to say right now we're going to sit in this room in silence for 20 minutes... For some of you, that would be like torture because the absence of stimulation would be almost unbearable. Um, uh, that's uh, people that, that struggle with, uh, you know, with life controlling issues like drug addiction. They talk in the same terms, actually, uh, as, uh, as that. And so um, we actually need to detox, uh, and, and I do detox uh, and put limitations around um, how much I access entertainment media because it's making us really hyperactive and so we don't have the mental space. So that's one of the problems that pres- it, it makes us, what, what I would call, I'd, I'd refer to a sort of kind of existential absence, like we're not really present uh, because, because our minds are so, you know, uh, so frenetic and, and we can't be still and, and just inhabit silence. And uh, we, we actually have in our church, first Monday of every month, we have this thing called the waiting room and people come in and we sit in silence for an hour together. And it's so good. Um, and yeah, if the more you can't do that, the more you need it. So uh, anyway, there's, a, there's an idea. Get together. We're exciting lot here. Get together and sit in silence and do nothing. That's my suggestion for you. <laughs> Anyway, Lauren, uh, over, over to you.